the topic today is water policy and the drought, balancing competing interests. I think a key thing is that we do have some very exciting technologies to address our challenges. That's why our emphasis today is on the question of policy. How do we make things happen? Uh, California, I think we all realize, can be quite a paradox. Uh, it's, we've got the greatest public university in human history, uh, a state which is a leader in innovation. Uh, we can be extraordinarily efficient in regulating electrical appliances like refrigerators, and yet we have mind-boggling mind tax policies like Proposition 13. I don't think if any of you want to know how much Disneyland pays in property tax. Uh, and also, we were the last state to regulate groundwater. So it's a complicated state. Sometimes we do things very well, sometimes not so well. Uh, we are very fortunate today to have a very distinguished panel. I'm, I'm very excited about this. I've had a chance to read a number of materials they have prepared. We've had some email dialogue. So I know you're going to get some tremendous insights. I'm going to introduce our panelists in the order in which they'll speak. Uh, to my immediate right is David Sedlak, who's co-director of the Berkeley Water Center. He's a professor of mineral engineering. He's a director of the Institute of Environmental Science and Engineering. He's very interested in the development of local sources of water. He's authored a, a wonderful book called Water 4.0. Uh, and he's also done a lot of research focused on wastewater reuse and uh, new approaches for managing the urban water cycle, amongst many other things. Our next speaker is Felicia Marcus, who is chair of the State Water Resources Board. Uh, happily, she has worked in both the public and private sector, so I hope she'll have some observations on the role for both. She's headed the LA Department of Public Works, which has garnered numerous awards for environmental excellence. She's been the Western Director for the National Natural Resources Defense Council and an Executive Vice President of the Trust for Public Land, which does outstanding work. Our last speaker to my far right is Mel Levine, who has served in the California Assembly from 77 to 82, U.S. Congress from 83 to 93, President of the L.A. Department of Water and Power, Council and former partner at Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, and at the request of Vice President Gore, was co-president of Builders for Peace, a private sector effort that was assisting, assisting in addressing the Middle East peace process, which was probably but good background for dealing with water issues in California. <laughs> so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to David. And both David and Felicia are going to provide us a bit of a context. I mean, I think there's not a day almost when we read in the paper something about water in California. So they're going to give us a little framework to evaluate these issues. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm glad to see everyone's doing their part for the drought. Um, I cut off my long hair to, uh, to save water for the drought, and it's, it's working out pretty good. Our, our per capita use is way down in my household. Um, I, I came up with a, a question I wanted to answer this morning to kick off the panel, and I realized the question um, is a question that I really can't answer. Um, and, and maybe I look to your help to answering it. Maybe we should read this without the question mark, as in, should California's cities seek water self-sufficiency, dot, 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 the following will happen. So I think we could have had this discussion about the drought and public policy in 1977 after that drought, and we could have had it in 1992 after that drought or during that drought. Drought, but we're having this one today, and rather than do a repeat of those uh, those previous discussions, I think there's something different this time. What's different this time is that our technologies have evolved to a point where it's possible for cities to ask this question about self-sufficiency. And I want to show you today kind of what's going through the minds of city managers and uh, elected officials and utility managers as they contemplate how much resources and effort to put into uh, pushing towards water self-sufficiency. And then I want to show you that this is kind of uh, has a chance to really shake up the battle lines in this long-standing uh, debate 
between water and whether water in California should be allocated to uh, agriculture, the environment, and cities, or what fraction of our water should go to those three important users that have uh, claims on it. And so I, I'll, I'll do that, and then hopefully the other panelists can give you a little bit more background on the public policy elements of things. So a little background of our city's imported water supply. So if you think about where the water comes from for our cities in our main metropolitan areas of Southern California and the Bay Area, in the south it comes from the Colorado River, there's a picture of Lake Mead, or the Eastern Sierra, uh, Mono Lake, or it comes from the northern part of the state and it passes through the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. So anyone who's a student of uh, California water or has read Cadillac Desert or just follows the newspaper knows that these are three pressure points with respect to the state's water system. Here in the Bay Area, we're blessed to mainly be supplied by two imported water systems, the Hetch Hetchy system, which brings water to San Francisco, and the McCullamy system that brings water to the East Bay. There are other systems out there, but I'm giving you a sense of what we have to provide us with water. And you can see that these all rely upon surface water. And surface water is very interesting with respect to its response to the drought because there's only so much water you can store in a reservoir, and they get depleted after a four or five or six year drought. So we're doing a great job managing our water, but if it doesn't rain, these, uh, these water bodies are gonna become more and more stressed. And so there's this new approach that's uh, arising to uh, diversify our water supply and reduce our risk of catastrophic drought and their local water sources. And so last week uh, we had a meeting, uh, Felicia was there and a number of other people from around the state uh, in Southern California, we asked the question, could Los Angeles become water self-sufficient? And I've had discussions with the Association of Bay Area Governments about whether the Bay Area could become water self-sufficient. And it really comes down to how much uh, we invest in these four different approaches for diversifying our water supply. Stormwater harvesting, that is if you thought about the amount of water that falls in our cities, if we could capture half of that water, it would be enough to get us through the entire year. Now our California hydrology makes that challenging, but you could see if we could capture a quarter of our water, that would be half of our water supply. And we're seeing utilities in Southern California, Sonoma County Water Agency, and others investing more and more money in stormwater harvesting, so capturing the water that actually falls within the city limits. Um, water reuse is this practice of water recycling where we take the water that goes into our sewage treatment plants and we treat it to the point where we can use it for a drinking water supply. So you may have heard of the kind of so-called purple pipe approach, the idea of treating our, our sewage affluent so it could be used for landscape irrigation. The current direction that things are going is actually treating that water to be part of the potable water supply and it would be equal to all the other waters in terms of how it goes into the system and how it satisfies our demand. And since we use about half of our water indoors and could recover 80% of that, that's enough to grow our water supply by about 40% if we could recycle it all. There's water use efficiency, that's, uh, that's the water geek shorthand for conservation and, uh, and stopping the leaks. And so we all know about the state's uh, success in reducing water use by about 35% uh, in, in many communities. And that's something that probably won't go away after the drought, or if we put our minds to it, won't go away. We could probably squeeze a little more out of that till we get to the point of being like Australia or Israel, and, and that'll get us probably uh, another third uh, of our water supply growing. And then we have seawater desalination, the so-called option of last resort. But there are many countries around the world now that are getting a significant fraction of their drinking water from seawater desalination. This technology has become more and more efficient over time. So Perth, Australia, Israel, they get more than half of their drinking water from seawater desalination. Here in California, we have a new desalination plant coming online in Carlsbad, north of San Diego, 50 million gallons a day, and it'll be online this fall. It'll be the largest desalination plant in the Western Hemisphere. So there's not a question of whether we can do it, Technologically, it's possible and it's cost competitive with the kinds of water supplies we've been developing. I want to think a little about the policy implications and the kind of economic implications of uh, what happens if we do do it. So the first thing I want you to recognize is that our current water supply system is very energy intensive. 
So the red uh, bars here show you the uh, energy used to provide water by either the Colorado River system or the state water project delivering water to Los Angeles. And whichever units you care for, kilowatt hour per acre foot or kilowatt hour per cubic meter, um, providing water to California cities, especially Southern California, is about the most energy intensive thing we can do with our imported water systems. For example, the yellow bars are seawater desalination. So there are parts of Los Angeles where we use more energy to pump water up and over the Tehachapis than it takes to actually desalinate seawater. All of the other technologies I talked about use less energy. Water efficiency uses zero energy. It's like virtual water, you're creating water. Um, water reuse, the blue bars here, water recycling, uses uh, less than a quarter of the energy that, uh, that desalination or imported water takes. Um, and, and many of the other practices that we can adopt, like stormwater harvesting. So when we get serious about greenhouse gas reductions, um, imported water doesn't look like such a good thing. And three of these four uh, local water sources are much more energy efficient. Water security. This is a figure from the IPCC's report on uh, climate change, and it shows you the predicted uh, rain, average rainfall that uh, changes in rainfall, rather, that will occur as climate change uh, hits us. And so the way you read this figure is that uh, for each degree centigrade increase in global temperature, that's the, de that's the percentage decrease or increase in water. So at best case scenario, the planet warms by two degrees centigrade in the coming century, probably going to be more like three or four. And you can see that uh, uh, in the, the Bay, in California, the predictions could be somewhere around 10 or 12 percent reduction in uh, precipitation. And if you couple that with warmer temperatures, meaning more evaporation and evapotranspiration, and the shift of our uh, precipitation from, rain, uh, from snow to rain, uh, we're going to have a real problem with those imported water water supplies. There are other things about water security that imported water supplies are particularly vulnerable to, like earthquakes. An earthquake could happen and cut your, uh, your water intake. Uh, one of the Delta uh, islands could fail in the Sacramento Delta and contaminate the water supply with salt. So these local water supplies have a benefit in terms of security. And finally, I just want to mention something that I'm calling the Lee Kuan Yew effect. Um, in, 19, in the 1960s, when Singapore and Malaysia became independent from Britain, uh, the Prime Minister of Malaysia said this quote here, um, if Singapore's foreign policy is prejudicial to Malaysia's interests, we could always bring pressure to bear on them by threatening to turn off the water at Johor. And Johor was the imported water supply from Malaysia. So Singapore, the nation state, city state, uh, uh, basically had a foreign country uh, controlling their water supply. And that foreign country uh, had already indicated that they might try to influence Singapore in many ways. And uh, Lee Kuan Yew had lived through the Japanese invasion of Singapore. And the first thing the Japanese did was uh, bomb the water supply and, and cause the uh, the allies to surrender. And so uh, water supply in Singapore has been a national security issue for decades now. And Singapore diversified their water supply using the approaches I showed you here. And when it came time for Singapore to renegotiate their contracts with Malaysia, they were in a much better position than they would have been had they not uh, diversified their water supply. And I think that as we move into this discussion about uh, cities, and agriculture and the environment and their claims on water supply and investments that we might make in the future in water supply, it's useful for us to think about Singapore and how by diversifying their water supply and approaching self-sufficiency, they were able to uh, negotiate from a position of more power. And when we think about people in the cities trying to represent the interests of cities and the environment, um, these diversifications that we're seeing will change that political dynamic. And with that, I'll turn it over to the other speakers and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. OK. Uh, Felicia Marcus. Hi, uh, that's, uh, David is so great. He's one of my heroes on this. He's, he's done more to make water intelligible to people uh, with Water 4.0 and just with his uh, skill and being able to bring complex issues down to an intelligible thing I, c I really need to learn. So his 
I'm about to give you the Spalding Gray approach to California water, um, which is uh, in just a few minutes uh, it, it, to give you just a sense of some of the issues out there and, and focus a bit on civility towards the end to seed our conversation. Um, I'll tell you at the outset, I got more words on these slides than you should ever have, and there are more slides than you should ever have. And I did it because it'll be PDF and you can use it for notes later on. So I'm not going to go through everything. But I want to give you uh, a little bit of a sense of where we are in California water. I won't hit every single issue. We don't have a lot of time. But uh, hopefully I'll have choosed chosen wisely, uh, again, to start the conversation. Uh, I talk a little bit about California water to arm you, because there's a lot of dialogue out there that tends to be of the level of an Emily Latella uh, Saturday Night Live skit or a Monty Python routine. I always call it the is so, is not, you're a jerk, no, I'm not level of discourse that characterizes California water. Um, and so we're going to I'm going to focus on that a bit, given the nature of the center. Uh, give you a bit of a drought update, because we are in the worst drought of the century, and then talk a bit about the future. And I, uh, like David, am actually optimistic that we have all the tools we need uh, to really extend our water resources and intelligently face a, a challenging future, even with a climate change, with our climate change scenarios and with population growth. But the key element that it's going to take to achieve that is folks getting off their butts and off their uh, high horses and working together in ways uh, that the discourse doesn't always uh, provide. So this is uh, what I call the elephant slide. And this is, I did this so it could be a wallet card um, to remind people. I've made wallet cards out of this and laminated them. Um, and the reason there's an elephant on it is because of the parable of the blind men and the elephant where they're each touching a different part of this miraculous creature and describing something completely different. And that is frequently what the discourse is all about, where people will see, even people I've seen working in water for decades, will know one piece of it very clearly and seemingly have no idea of the other piece or not value the other pieces or belittle the other pieces. Belittling is somehow better than not even acknowledging them. And so this is just to, to arm you a bit on the basics so that when someone comes up and says, if those insert expletive jerks, agencies, whatever, would we'll just do this one thing, we wouldn't have any problems. We can conserve our way to the future. We can build a few dams and the problem will be gone. You know, you will know that they're just wrong. They may, may just be misguided, they may be sincere, but they're wrong. The answer lies in taking a diversified series of uh, actions. And, and frankly, my, my bottom line point is we have to do them all, and we have to do them all now. The good news is we're on the march to doing them all now. So here's what you need to know. First is we do have the most variable hydrology in the country. When it rains and snows, it really does. And when it doesn't, it really doesn't. And that requires a different kind of management strategy than you would have if you had more consistent rainfall. It means that storage is important. Storage is not a dirty word. It has become a dirty word in some parts of the community who see every dam and the havoc they have indeed wrought on salmon populations and other populations in particular as a dirty word. But the fact of the matter is our, our precipitation does not fall where most of our people and most of our agriculture is our, and our economic uses. It doesn't fall in the time of year. California, as we know it today, would not exist if it weren't for that system that David put up there. And that system was put up there with the conveyance, but also with the storage, precisely because it doesn't rain a regular amount and snow a regular amount every year. So that's just the reality we have to deal with in managing our water system. We have to plan for multi-year droughts. I mean, what we have learned in this drought, which is interesting, is that urban areas, even since the last drought, have managed to do an awesome job, large urban areas, of becoming resilient in the face of our normal three-year drought cycle, which is something to really be <coughs> proud of. The problem we have this year is we are not in a normal three-year drought cycle. We are in the drought of our lives. So I'll get back to that. The other thing is that every area has a different mix of sources. Can have surface water. Can have surface water. It can see. Most Californians can't see where their water comes from. It comes from that system because most Californians live in Southern California. Most Californians live in urban areas. If you take Southern California plus our coastal urban areas up and down the coast, you've got the vast majority of our population, and their water comes from hundreds of miles away, other than some areas that do use groundwater. Some have groundwater, some don't. A groundwater basin can be different here than to the other end of the building. It, the geology can be very different, so all groundwater basins are not alike. Some areas don't have any at all like San Diego doesn't have any large ones to speak of. Well, that's why you have San Diego investing money in desal, 
And you have San Diego being on the cutting edge pushing for direct potable reuse. Why? Because they don't have a big groundwater basin that they can put captured stormwater into or recycled water that needs to be percolated for further treatment. So necessity is the mother of invention there. And for them, being at the end of every pipe and not having a groundwater basin, uh, either as a resource or to use for storage, they have to go to the most expensive uh, to try and diversify their portfolios. Again, so the conversation about water is going to vary depending upon where you are and what you're talking about. No silver bullet. Uh, a friend of mine calls it silver buckshot. Um, but it's actually, uh, how we're, that's kind of a violent, it's like killing birds, one bird with two cents, a violent metaphor. I like to try sports metaphors, go bears. Um, but I didn't come up with one for this talk. I actually am a bear alum, I realized as I was sitting here this morning, but more of a bear cub. Summer school, 1977. <laughs> go bears. I root for the bears. Um, the, the key, key thing here is climate change and other drivers is uh, game changers. Uh, what David was talking about, about that change in temperature, that means we're going to lose our snowpack more often than not. That's why this year is also bad, not just because we're in the fourth year of a drought, but because it was warmer. We have the worst snowpack in 500 years. So you can look at reservoir levels in January, but what the experts know is that the snow is going to melt and refill those reservoirs during the course of the spring and summer or replenish surface waters. We just don't have any this year. And that's what's going to be regular in a time of climate, which is why if you look, is it two, is it three, is it four, is it five decades down, we're in a pickle even if we don't grow, which is a piece of why the administration started working on a different strategy even before the drought uh, became apparent. Our population will grow. And then we also know that while this may be the drought of our century and our lives or our grandparents' lives, we know from geophysical evidence that we've had much longer droughts in California. Apparently, there was a doozy around the time of Henry VIII. Um, so we know it can happen here. And we know it did happen in Australia in the last decade, where they had had the same three-year drought cycle. And they say they thought that it was going to rain uh, for about six years, because they usually had a three-year drought cycle. And then it rained a little, and they thought, wow, they dodged a bullet another bullet metaphor, sorry, uh, that they were going to be OK. And then they had the three worst years yet, and they had to do everything that was on uh, David's Fawcett chart all at once because they couldn't risk their major centers. And they hemorrhaged billions of dollars on desal facilities that have never been operated, but that they're still paying for. So they said, hey, it's an expensive insurance policy. Believe me, as they head back into drought, other than in Perth, which uses it, um, it's cheaper to do the conservation, recycling, and stormwater capture. So that's what they have been doing. We're trying to avoid that economic uh, and environmental impact. And then, of course, as David said, there are a mix of solutions. And those solutions, as I indicated, are going to vary. And we've got to t talk about storage. The only thing that can approximate that snowpack in size are groundwater basins. So that's why the administration pushed for groundwater legislation passed last. Took 100 years to do it after the surface water system um, uh, came into being. And uh, it, it'll take a while to do, but it's, it's pretty good. And then the drought, of course. Uh, I've already talked about why it's bad. It's particularly bad. Let me just flash through these, just as a sense. That's a snowpack slide. It's kind of depressing. We're the line way at the bottom that doesn't even rise above the bottom. And then impacts. Hundreds of thousands of acres of fields fallowed in the Central Valley. It would be 10 times as bad if they didn't rely on groundwater. A lot of folks out of work. The groundwater levels are dropping precipitously. That's a zero-sum game of sorts. Um, but you want to use your groundwater in a time of drought. Thank God it was there. And we've got a plan to make sure it's there for the next one. There are issues we can talk about if you want. We've been delivering uh, water to communities in tankers, in bottles. We've been running pipe and drilling wells. Small rural communities, they know where their water comes from and where, when it's gone. Um, a big issue in the rural parts of the state, huge fish and wildlife issues. And you've seen the um, wildfire impact. We've done a lot. I won't go through it. Uh, food disaster reliefs, a lot of changes in our water rights permits, emergency changes, same with federal rules, uh, cutbacks in contract water. That system that you saw has been cut back, at least the spine of it, from the state and federal projects. We've curtailed water rights, meaning juniors are cut off 100 percent in favor of their seniors because we have a seniority-based system in California, like most of the West. We've even cut off junior-senior water rights holders who have never been cut off before, and we're in litigation. We'll be in a lot of litigation. We've also tried to speed more water uh, on recycling in particular. We goosed um, 
1% financing fairly early. We streamlined permitting for outdoor use and groundwater recharge, and we're working very quickly with an expert panel on the um, use for indirect potable and surface water, again, where you just put it in a reservoir, but it's gonna get retreated again. Uh, or for direct potable, we'll have an expert panel thing. And then the wa urban water conservation regs, which we are the first state in the nation to do that at a statewide level, and it was something the governor felt he had to do when on April 1st, one month before the end of the snow season, there was just no snow to measure at the uh, annual snowpack or the monthly snowpack survey. And of course, we ended up getting um, a, a bond pass, thank you very much to all of you who voted for it, uh, because it was part of a plan, which I'll show you in just a moment. Uh, and that gives us money for conservation, recycling, stormwater capture, cleaning up contaminated groundwater basins, ecosystem protection, et cetera. Uh, we're doing pretty well. Um, folks have changed, uh, saved a lot. Uh, some have saved 40. 45%, others not so well, a sliding scale based on how much folks had done over the past 20 years or even uh, past the, uh, when the drought was declared. Um, what I've been saying is in the last big drought of the late 80s and early 90s, we learned what we could do indoors. Um, we can still do more, but huge push, particularly in Southern California on low flow toilets, shower fixtures, retrofitting, messaging about not leaving the water running when you brush your teeth and the like. Uh, this drought is showing us what we can do outdoors because of the stat that uh, David talked about where urban water users use 50% or in some cases a lot more of their water outdoors on ornamental landscaping, and that just seemed like the most cost-effective and the least quality-of-life intrusive uh, way to try and save water, given that we didn't know if we were in our own millennial drought or not, and we still do not know. And so that water saved on uh, artificially making our lawns look like they're in Ireland or Scotland uh, is water we're going to really need in the case of multiple dry years for much more important efforts, and, uh, and keeping it in Local storage is really very important, particularly when our supplemental state and federal projects uh, covered is bare. And we discovered our groundwater basins, which is really terrific. But we still have that kind of conflict that you've all seen that I talked about, whether it's fish versus people, environmentalists versus agriculture, urban versus ag, and the scapegoating and blaming of a particular water use that one might not like. This is a classic pattern to go through. It's people want to think there's something wrong or there's blame, and that doesn't mean there isn't, but it is a distraction from actually trying to solve our problems and figure out how to get better together. El Nino will not save us. I am sorry to be the one to say this. Um, last year, uh, the El Nino predictions and the media lack of caveating of that really cost us a lot of water, as people believed. Oh, three-year drought cycle, El Nino will save us. Why do I have to conserve? So we lost a lot of momentum. This year, the signs for El Nino are much greater, but the reporting has been much better talking about the caveats. We don't know really whether it will be. We, we won't know till it hits. I, they're saying uh, December, even though it's likely we'll have one. It may just rain a lot and, and uh, flood a lot in Southern California, may not make it up north where those big reservoirs are, may not snow. We have no idea. The ridiculously resilient ridge or blob that's been off the coast of Northern California is still there. Maybe it'll come at us and go around us like it did the last few years. We just can't know. We'll take all the rain and snow we can safely handle, and we don't want all the flooding, but again, this is not a reason to let down our guard. So I always say, how do we, we don't know. We just don't, we don't know. I love the marshmallow burn on Mr. Stapuff's chest. I don't know why I love this. This is like my favorite picture. If I were a Facebook poster, I would send this one around, but I try to be more serious about my Facebook posts. So there's the reality. There's uh, uh, January 2013 and January 2014. It's the same or worse right now. This is California on climate change. This will become the regular thing. This is the Godzilla of all wake-up calls to have to change and do all that retrofitting so that we can face that future. The reality is we're gonna have sea level rise. That is not gonna be good for those Delta Islands. Let me just say that. And fish and wildlife are in the tank. Not in the tank, that's a bad metaphor, but they're not doing, they're not in the tank. They're not in the toilet either. They're, um, they're really in trouble. Um, let's just put it that way. We've taken too much water from them and blocked all their natural habitat, and we need to, we do need to, to do a better job of um, redressing that. Our population's gonna rise. We're not gonna be exporting our young. I used to say eating our young because I hung out with rugby players in college, and I thought that was a little too gruesome. Um, but the reality is we can do something about it, and David's book, of course, is one way um, to do it, and what, he, what, what 
it, he talked about is also important is there's a way to look at the full-on water cycle to make the most use of every drop of water and every dollar. Because right now, our flood control people, our water supply people, our wastewater people, you know, go through the list, tend to do their own thing in their specialties, and increasingly integrated water management is becoming a big deal, particularly in Southern California cities, San Francisco, and Sacramento, I have to say, was one of the early adopters of the Sacramento Water Forum. They really, and YOLO, I mean, they're, there are all kinds of things happening that are really good. And the reality, just so I'm not totally depressing again, is that we are doing a lot about it. There are all kinds of integrated water management projects happening, people coming together. There are f farmers helping fish in the Sac Valley in a way that's really remarkable, birds too. There are drought angels helping folks. The legislature has taken more action in the last few years than in the last three decades. Now, I'm pretty cynical about the legislatures, but I, you have to give credit where credit is due, whether it's passing the human right to water legislation, that's a whole issue of safe drinking water that we can talk about if you're interested, Delta reform legislation 09, which is what drew me back into the water world after having run screaming out of it. Um, at the end of the Clinton administration, when I was, like Dave Howkamp back there, we were back at EPA working on air and water issues, but water issues in particular, I, I always say I was tired of being the princess of peace, and uh, it's hard to be the princess of peace when you're pissed. So I had to take a break and go to land conservation. <laughs> and then um, groundwater legislation passing the point. The bond is awesome. It happened because the governor said he would only do it if it was part of a plan versus the usual grab bag. I'll show you the plan. You can look at it later on your, your own. Uh, they moved the drinking water program and created the Office of Sustainable Solutions in our office. So you'd have one uh, agency responsible source to tap so we could do that kind of integrated thinking. And then we got all kinds of tools to get information and enforce our uh, ancient water right system in California. Um, and those have been uh, seen as just as inviolate as not touching groundwater. So again, perfect, no, but progress, uh, yes. And again, all kinds of great things at the local level as well. Water action plan, I'm just gonna say, um, is easy to look up but you have to do the water action plan or else you get the California water plan, which is great and huge. But this is just a 20 page or so document that's basically our manifesto uh, from almost two years ago before the drought to say, here's what we have to do to deal with climate change. We have to get over ourselves and we have to do it all. As opposed to picking winners and losers, stakeholder, your favorite stakeholder in a given administration, we're putting it all on deck. Conservation, recycling, stormwater capture, desal, appropriate cases, dealing with the Delta, both conveyance and ecosystem protection, preparing for drought, preparing for floods, protecting ecosystems ahead of the curve rather than waiting for the Endangered Species Act to kick, kick in, safe water, flood protection, et cetera, and also doing it in a flexible way and figuring out how to fund it. Are we done? No. Are we on the march? Yes, because everybody could see themselves here and could relent on seeing their other folks seeing their issue up here. And it's actually worked something of a miracle with some people. The water wars are not over. It's not all one big happy family. Uh, but we know that our relationship with water has to evolve. Mayor Garcetti of LA issued a water directive some months ago to cut LA's reliance on imported water in half in 10 years. That's using all those tools. Well, they, now they have to do it, which is why I keep putting this slide up and reminding everybody who will listen that he said it. Um, but. <laughs> They're going to have to be cutting edge on conservation, recycling, stormwater capture. That's their plan. And, then, and out of it, he knows he's going to get to Greenest City, the most park per city in the nation. So there are multiple benefit win-wins. May not yield all the water in the world. Uh, other things, I think recycling uh, will yield more dollar-for-dollar uh, dollar benefits, but stormwater capture allows for flood control and greening and uh, water quality improvements. And then our relationship with each other has to evolve, and this gets to the civility part of it all. You've got ag, you've got, I, I don't know why this fisherman kissing a salmon, I really like that picture, I'm sorry, that one is, <laughs> cracked me up. Um, the environmentalist um, and uh, urban water users, um, as opposed to finger pointing, have to figure out how to reach across divides and figure out how everybody gets what they need. And if you have that conversation, you can get a lot done. And that's what integrated water management promises, some money dangling there for people who come together across traditional divides and in certain geographies to get something done. I always call this the challenge of ecosystem management. Some of you have heard me say that, not ecosystem management. You have to learn to deal with people who don't come from the same way of life, who don't have the same interests, and figure out how to move forward together, just like you do in land conservation, actually.
And then, uh, just to give you a couple pictures of where the conflict uh, tends to be, uh, the California water pie is one where how you slice it becomes a topic of dialogue. Some of the stats you will hear, agriculture uses 80% of the developed water, urban uses 20, that 80-20. You have to say developed water, because it's not all the water, it's the water taken out for human use. Agriculture folks hate that. They prefer the 50% to the environment, 40% to ag, 10% to um, urban, which is actually the same pie. But then the misnomer and what they're saying there is that they make it sound, and, and some of them believe, that all 50% is going to those crazy environmental regulations. Well, they're not. They're actually going to wild and scenic rivers that Ronald Reagan took off the um, plan way back when. Uh, they go to require delta outflow to protect against salinity intrusion. If it gets too salty, it's not good for anybody in the delta or for export in Southern California, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one little slice of it, maybe 10% of it, is for in-stream flow for fish, and that's been slashed during the course of this drought. Just saying. So I, I would say a pox on all the pies, because people argue about the pie and use it uh, in whatever way makes them feel a little bit better, but it's not useful. And then finally, people have picked whatever use they don't like, whether it's new development, bottled water, uh, fracking, almonds, et cetera, to think it must be somebody else. It can't be something I can do. And I can go through each of these if you're interested. And there are issues with each of these that are legitimate in every community and every concern on every issue. But it's not a drought issue, actually. Walnuts take five times as much water as an almond. Should we ban walnuts? Beer takes a lot more water to make than bottled water. <laughs> Whenever I suggest, like, should we ban beer, everybody backs off. <laughs> Fracking actually doesn't use that much water in California. It has issues. They all have issues. And new development is usually more efficient than old development, and many communities are just forcing them to retrofit and more. So actually, new development can make you more water efficient. So again, complex, not simple. And this was my favorite, that people blame the governor and saying the problem was cheese. It was cheese. Well, it's true. Meat and cheese, dairy products, it takes a lot of water. That burger, hundreds. Steak, 1,600 gallons. So your food is your major consumption of water, not even your lawn. And it's urban people who are eating agricultural products. And when people say, oh, ag, they're using it. It's not like they're growing things to have a party at the end of the year and pat themselves on the back. So in any event, with that, if we can keep all that in mind and figure out how to move forward, uh, we're off to the races. Thank you, Felicia. And our next speaker is Mel Levine, who I mentioned in my introduction, spent five years in the Assembly and 10 years in Congress. And I think one thing that's kind of a recurring theme when we talk about issues in this country is the issue of political will. Whether you're talking about gun control or pension reform, people will say it's all a question of political will, which doesn't make me feel very good, because it seems that that's something we're oftentimes lacking. But Mel, I'd love to hear your perspective on, on, on that front. Thank you very much, Dick. Uh, first of all, I want to say that it's a real honor to be able to share a platform with David and Felicia. They're, as, you, as you've heard, they're two of the wisest and most thoughtful leaders in water policy, not only in the Bay Area and in California, but in the country. I've been long familiar with David's work. We don't know each other. Felicia, I have admired for over 30 years. We worked together a million years ago when we, um, when we were both a few years younger. And I have really uh, admired the leadership she's provided to the state and the country dur during all of that time. Um, it's also a real privilege to be here with, uh, I guess, primarily the class of 68. Um, as someone from the class of 64, uh, it's nice to be speaking to a bunch of younger people. Uh, <laughs> um, I also um, want to salute the Goldman School. Uh, I'm a proud member of the advisory board of the Goldman School. I think the Goldman School of Public Policy has been a magnificent institution for Cal, uh, for UC, for the state, for the country. I want to salute Dean Brady, under whose leadership the Goldman School has really uh, become um, preeminent. So congratulations, Henry. Uh, 
Um, for those of you, um, those few of you who may follow some of this and have very long memories, uh, you would know that during my time in the state legislature and in the Congress, I had a strong environmental record. And I live in Los Angeles. So I'm sure that for some of you, those facts alone should qualify me to offer my remarks today. Um, I am not sure that I um, can answer all the questions of political will. What I intend to do today is really raise uh, issues that are complex and difficult, as Felicia indicated in her remarks. I intend to raise issues and raise questions rather than to provide answers. Um, the reason for this complexity may, ha may be at least in part uh, because we live in a state that epitomizes Mark Twain's immortal words that uh, whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. Um, and in light of that history, uh, the difficulty in ending the rhetoric and building consensus and seeking the civility that the class of 68 is seeking is no easy task. Uh, but an often unstated but important part of our situation is that we live in a state that not only borders the ocean, but also discharges tremendous volumes of both wastewater and stormwater annually. We are not in the Dust Bowl territories. So to be fair, in California, there is really no such thing as being out of water. What there is is a shortage of cheap fresh water. The technology to change that is readily available. And we know that finding sustainable water solutions for California is completely within our grasp. The conversation about how to get there is very much about politics, ideology, and policy. And like so much of what we face today, uh, many of those choices boil down to money and how money is spent. In most any normal year, Preserving and protecting water rights is an issue left to water engineers, lawyers, and staff from the state's water agencies. They deal in a world of minutia and long drawn out battles that mostly go on behind the scenes and that are not regularly followed by the public. However, in times of shortage like those we are experiencing now, there are very public discussions about sharing what water is available, reallocating water rights, developing new supplies and more. And water uh, is often discussed in these conversations as if it is a socialized commodity. But in California, water is not a socialized commodity. In other societies, some other societies, places like Israel, for example, and Australia now, water is regarded as an issue of national security. And as Felicia indicated, or I guess it's David, was it either David or Felicia, I got the, the, uh, the, the slides mixed up, David indicated, look at Singapore, uh, where water is controlled by the state. Uh, in Israel, there's even a national water company. So making needed societal uh, water policy changes can be obviously made much more easily when you have a socialized system of water. In California, on the other hand, water is a first in right use, much like historical land and mining rights, with priority given in the order a claim is made. Outside of the governor's current drought out orders, there is nor normally no divvying up of water supplies for the greater good, and agencies negotiate their own deals to procure water and gain an advantage in cost or reliability. Communities compete for water, and environmental protection is ensured through laws and mitigation requirements. So when we find ourselves in the position we are in now, talk of changing the way water is allocated is actually very unusual and is foreign to the public discourse in California, other than in times like this. Right now, cities are complying with the governor's call for statewide water cuts, but as Felicia may suspect, the all-for-one and one-for-all approach of shared sacrifice is likely to wear thin if we enter another dry year. The fact is that California's urban customers have paid a lot for the water rights and infrastructure that supplies them. Southern California happens to be in particularly good shape because it collectively invested $5 billion through the Metropolitan Water District for local storage and sufficient water to make it through a prolonged drought. Cities have individually invested heavily in conservation and new sources of local water supply, 
and they will want the benefit of the investments their ratepayers have made. And in addition or prior to the um, goals that Mayor Garcetti outlined that uh, Felicia put on the uh, board, it's important to understand that the city of Los Angeles, um, with one million more people today than it had in the early 1970s, today uses the same amount of water for the population of Los Angeles as Los Angeles did 45 years ago. That's quite extraordinary. Um, and they are going to want the benefits of the conservation efforts they've made over two generations. So we have a far from a more socialized approach to statewide water management. Does this mean that water rights can never be apportioned differently? Certainly they, they could. But in assessing these prospects, a slew of complex, tough issues arise, many of which Felicia identified, especially toward the end of her remarks. Uh, I intend to touch on a number of these to focus on some of the issues, and again, as I said, not really to answer the questions, but to put them out there. Water rights are like a proprietary right. So if water rights were taken back by the state and reallocated, it would be viewed as a taking that would require compensation. Why? Because an area's economic viability and competitiveness rely greatly on its ability to have a reliable and affordable water supply. While we hear in the news about particular Northern California farmers effectively holding the state hostage by virtue of their senior water rights, let's remember that both Los Angeles and San Francisco are also prime examples of early California water rights in action as David's chart showed with regard to importation of water in both parts of the state. Cities and economies grow and flourish based on their access to good, affordable water. Reallocating water rights is still possible, but existing water rights holders would have to be compensated for by the loss of those rights. It would, be, have, to be, it would have to be handled similarly to a fair market value payment in an eminent domain proceeding. Possible, but very expensive. And with all of these issues, huge and difficult equity questions are not far from the surface. If we accept that a reallocation of water rights is truly a reallocation of property rights and ultimately of wealth, then we have to ask ourselves the flip side of the water rights question. Why should someone who came later get to take the water right from someone who came earlier? Is it because we as a state now see a better and higher use for water than we did before? Is it because those with junior rights would like the cost of developing new water resources to be shared amongst all water users? Is it because of a shift in political influence and with it a chance to change the rules of the game? One way around this quagmire is to leverage the one restriction the state reserves on all water rights, which is California's constitutional prohibition against the waste, against waste and the requirement that water use constitutionally in this state be both reasonable and beneficial. But these criteria have never really been defined. The courts have essentially said you have to look at this on a case-by-case -case basis. So if they are raised in the future, here are just a few uh, samples of the issues that would arise. Is it wasteful to grow rice or almonds in an arid state? Is it wasteful to water golf courses? or water lawns in Palm Springs, or water lawns anywhere, for that matter? Should we limit certain types of water-intensive manufacturing? Felicia named one, very popular one, a few minutes ago. And there are others, but none that quite achieve the response that Felicia's did. <laughs> Perhaps it is unreasonable to put water down a stream to protect non-native sport fish, or to put water on a dry lake to protect non-endangered birds. And is it an unconstitutional taking without due process if water rights are reallocated? Uh, there are those who are beginning to make that argument today. On the flip side, is it reasonable for a small number of wealthy agribusinesses to maintain rights in, if urban users can barely shower? So there are lots of sacred cows in this state that are all difficult to come to grips with and which evoke strong emotional reactions that make it difficult to have an objective, civil, and informed discussion. This sort of discussion will require a good deal of intellectual honesty throughout the state. 
We cannot continue the north-south water controversy without acknowledging the fact that much of Northern California also imports its water. We also have to recognize that the economic engine of the urban areas is a benefit to rural areas too, and that, as Felicia indicated, goes both ways. In protecting our environment, a value I have always placed at the top of my list, we need to be honest about how much of California has been made or altered by man. We have to protect our environment, but at the same time be mindful that sometimes the environment we are protecting from water diversions is no more natural than are the farms and cities that water is diverted to. Ultimately, we need to move past blame and guilt and embrace a picture for California that we can collectively work toward, one that protects both people and the environment. Now back to the money. The development of water resource projects is typically paid for by those benefiting and receiving the water. Projects are paid for by participants and beneficiaries. For instance, if a new Delta facility is ever built, it will largely be paid for on an acre foot by acre foot basis by those receiving the water. The state is not going to shoulder the cost of the project at the public's expense. Beneficiary pays is the way it has always been done. We know that an infinite supply of usable water could be created here if we are willing to pay the price. In other parts of the world, water is much more expensive than it is here. Higher price water could easily pay for more recycling, even desalination, and innovative technologies, even things as simple as investing in better irrigation systems. However, redefining the value of water and creating a change in pricing will require a cultural shift. And unless water becomes a truly socialized commodity across all areas of the state, it is still going to be the beneficiaries who pay. Identifying the appropriate beneficiaries is crucial as we balance who pays for, California, for developing California's water resources. If ag pays more water, may f if ag pays more for water via irrigation improvements, wouldn't that cost be passed on to all those who benefit from the agricultural products? Should California urban users share the resource they have already paid for and also invest in new resources in order to make more water available to ag, business, or the environment? Should the cost of new resources simply be borne by, the commu by communities who wish to grow? Or maybe should we create a fee for certain types of water use? California is truly a marvelous state, but we are a state that to a large extent we either created or altered. Now we need to come to grips with the societal divisions we have made in the past and do a better job of managing them, and then decide how much we are willing to pay for water and who should bear that cost. I can clearly see why water issues, like so many complicated issues in our society, are only nibbled at around the edges, but we do have the technical ability to prepare ourselves for the future. As we do so, beginning with maximizing the essential conservation measures we have begun and with, which Felicia outlined so clearly, we will need to confront our own history and vital but challenging equity issues in planning for the future. As a state, the question remains whether we will coordinate our efforts together and how will we prepare to, be succe to successfully manage through a prolonged drought and climate change and do it civilly. Thank you.